Well, it's funny because when I was doing my PhD studies from 2013 to 2016, people would ask me, what are you studying? And I would say, political psychology. And everyone would say, what the hell is that? And I would say, well, it's basically the study of why we're so screwed up as a species. You know, around the world, uh, politics is, is pretty abysmal. We have terrible outcomes from tens of thousands of people dying daily due to malnutrition, just for one. We're, uh, running into climate catastrophe, we have uh, uh, the threat of nuclear war is still with us. Why, why do we have all these negative outcomes just from a psychological perspective? Uh, but then, after 2016, people would ask me the same thing. I would say the same answer, political psychology. And this time they'd respond with, oh, yes, that's very important. Uh, please keep doing that. So I think now a lot of people think of political psychology and then they think, oh, you must be trying to diagnose what Donald Trump has. Uh, political psychology is really easy to explain to people who know sports uh, because a lot of the same biases that are involved in politics, psychological biases, are involved in sports and people are very familiar with them. If you watch a, a tennis match, a football game, baseball game, anything, basketball, you support your team against the other team. So you bring to the game, to your viewing of the game, uh, a mindset that seeks to uh, find the bad things that the other team did and the good things that your team does. And it's basically what you do is you apply different epistemological standards uh, to both sides. So I look closely for fouls that the other team uh, did and if the referee doesn't see them I get very angry. They, they missed this blatant flat foul and the referees are biased, etc. Uh, but if my own team commits a foul and the referees don't see it. I probably didn't see it in the first place because I wasn't looking for it. But if the referee does call a foul, I'll be immediately angry also because I've been watching the game and I didn't see a foul, but it's just because I'm applying a different standard to the, my team than I am to the other team. And it's the exact same thing in politics. Uh, we have our ideology, our worldview, our political party, and we judge them by different standards than other political parties, opposing political parties, opposing ideologies, etc. And that goes down into our information practices. Uh, we look for sources of news that are supportive of what we believe, and we avoid sources of news that oppose what we believe and try to propose a different worldview or different ideology or different political program. So it's very similar to the what we see in sports and we all know how that works if you've ever sat down to watch a game with somebody who cheers for the other team uh, you, you just see a, an entirely different standard for uh, understanding how the game is working from one side versus the other sticking with the same uh, metaphor uh, there's a player on the the Patriots who otherwise I would very much like uh, name is Julian Edelman. He's uh, about my height. He plays uh, the position I used to like to play, and he's really, really good. Uh, and he's, he's shorter than the average. He's smaller than the average player. So, you know, I like the underdog teams, underdog players. I should really like this guy, but he's on the bad team, so I can't stand him. And every time he makes a good play, I'm angry. Uh, same thing happens with politics. So if I hear that uh, of a new politician, and I hear that that politician is in a party that I don't like, immediately my, my judgment towards that politician is going to be negative. I'm going to look for things I don't like about that politician. I'm gonna judge that politician by different standards. Uh, so if I find out that this politician uh, uh, mistreated a subordinate, for instance, I'm going to condemn that politician, whereas if I found out that that politician was on my team or my political party, and I heard that they mistreated their subordinates, I would be less likely to, to judge them harshly. I would think, oh, well, maybe this is just propaganda from the other side. Maybe it's exaggerated. Maybe there were good reasons for this alleged mistreatment. Uh, so, so this sort of thing just permeates the way that we look about politics. It's, it is rooted in uh, what's called in-group bias. Uh, just it's basically uh, that we, we treat people that we perceive to be part of our group or our tribe, our team, uh, with, a, with a different set of standards than we uh, judge people in another group. So it's, it's typically, uh, it's just a matter of treating people on our tribe, our team, our group more favorably. But then when you have uh, perceived competition between groups, it can also involve looking at other people negatively. So you see that throughout the, the world now with 
uh, anti-immigrant prejudice. Uh, it, it taps into this natural psychological groove of treating people on our team and our tribe differently from people in another tribe. And we can look at those other people very negatively as soon as we believe or are told to believe or we learn, even falsely, that that other group is harming our group. So the, the narratives you'll hear, the stories you'll hear from people who are anti-immigrant all over the world in many, many places is, oh, they are taking our resources. They are taking our jobs. Uh, they are uh, draining the government of the resources that could be applied to our group, the, the citizens, the non-immigrants. Uh, so that's a, a, a basic uh, part of political psychology is, is looking at how these psychological biases that evolved over tens, hundreds of thousands of years uh, affect the way that we think about politics today. There's also another side that looks at individual psychological characteristics of leaders and sees how those individual characteristics affect the way that they do diplomacy or they bargain in domestic politics, etc. And then there's also another interesting area that looks at ideas themselves and tries to ask or answer the question, uh, why do people believe what they believe about politics? Why do certain ideas, certain ideologies, worldviews, opinions, values, etc., why have they spread in some places and not in others? Uh, within a country, why are there you know, these people that believe this and those people that believe that, and also globally? I think the way that political psychology is relevant to understanding how the global political economic system works is in those, those second two areas I mentioned before. So in the area of how universal psychological biases affect, that everyone, affect the way that everyone around the world thinks about politics and processes information about politics. Uh, things like in-group bias, where you, you favor people in your group, in your nation, in your ethnic group, et cetera, over, over others. Um, also things like uh, confirmation bias, where it just feels bad to encounter an idea that attacks what we believe to be true. So we tend to avoid those things. Uh, it's somewhat similar to the, the sports metaphor. Again, we, if, you, if you know sports, you already know most of political psychology. Uh, you wouldn't choose to read an article or listen to a you know, sports commentator who has bad things to say about your team. I wouldn't go to a, uh, a sports commentator in the Boston area to hear about football because they're going to have nice things to say about the Patriots. And I don't like that. That makes me feel bad. Uh, I, I don't need to hear that because I can just watch the games on Sunday and already feel bad. <laughs> but we do the same thing with, with politics, right? So if you are a, let's say, liberal in the United States, you're not going to seek out right-wing sources or conservative sources of information because when you watch them or read them, it literally makes you feel bad. It's literally psychologically painful. So you hear this language uh, in some corners about uh, uh, safe spaces or, or snowflakes being too sensitive. Uh, that applies to everyone. All of us feel uh, a bit of psychological pain or discomfort when we hear an idea that attacks our beliefs. So we tend to avoid those things. Uh, so that's, that's one side. That's the, the universal psychological bias side. Uh, and that explains why you see certain patterns all over the world. Like I mentioned, the anti-immigrant uh, prejudice, you see that all over the world. Uh, but then the other side is looking at ideas themselves and asking, why do they spread? Uh, you could, you could uh, look at the issue of immigrant, anti-immigrant prejudice that way. Uh, so people around the world, because of the way the, the global economic system operates currently, you have large numbers of people who are very poor, working class, uh, maybe lower middle class, who have a very difficult life uh, and have very few uh, real prospects for moving up the ladder. So for those people, they want to, to understand the economic pain they're feeling. And the anti-immigrant explanation has a natural advantage because it's very simple. It, it explains their pain in a simple, easy to understand way. And it makes sense from their daily lived experience because you can go out and see 
uh, a construction site and there are immigrants working there or you, you go to a, a restaurant and you see immigrants working there. So it makes intuitive sense that maybe you, the problem uh, that you're, you're facing is all of these immigrants uh, taking your jobs. Same thing with government resources. Uh, it's easy to, to, to be told that these immigrants are taking government resources that could be used to you. So this immigrant explanation for economic pain has a natural advantage over other explanations. Because if you ask me here, oh, well, why don't you explain why uh, uh, there's so many people feeling economic pain? It would take me another hour to, to go through all of the reasons. And so that's an example of how the intrinsic nature of certain ideas give them an advantage, and other ideas have a disadvantage in spreading. But this is that, that third area of political psychology, I think, that's quite interesting and relevant for global political economy because this is now in the realm of soft power. Uh, soft power is the, the ability to influence uh, other people or other nations simply by making an option more attractive or making a, a country or its leadership more attractive or, or economic ideas, economic policies more attractive, etc. cetera. Uh, so in the realm of soft power, this area of political psychology is, is extremely relevant because then you have to look at, you know, why do people think what they think about China in the US? What do people who identify with the Democratic Party think about China? What do people in the Republican Party think about China? Why are there differences? What are the media sources that these two groups who are trying to learn about the world, uh, what are these media sources telling them about China? What information, basic facts are they getting? What interpretations of those basic facts are they getting? What narratives and overall worldviews are they encountering? So, that's how political psychology is, is particularly relevant to global political economy. Uh, it especially focuses on the realm of soft power. Uh, so for one example, you could take the US-China trade war. Uh, people in the US are generally kind of like fans of one team, uh, and people in China are generally fans of another team. So people in the US, when they hear the, the, the background to the trade war, they're more likely to hear in that it's more common in their media system. Uh, ideas like China is stealing intellectual property from the US, more likely to hear ideas like China is threatening to the US because it might overtake the US economically, and that would be terrible because China's human right, rights record is terrible. That's another idea that you're more likely to hear in the US. Uh, and all of these ideas are more likely to be accepted simply because the US is viewed as our team. Uh, so it taps into these, these tribal psychological mechanisms that evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and which we still have today and which still powerfully affect politics today. And then likewise in China you'll hear uh, a very different set of ideas to be accepted. Uh, so you have two things going on here. You have the supply side, the supply of ideas are radically different in the US versus China, but then you also have the demand side. The, the psychological biases that incline you to accept some ideas rather than others, both the supply and the demand side create what I'm talking about here, where people in the US are more likely to hear, A, and B, accept ideas like the ones I just said. And then likewise in China. So on the one hand, you're more likely to hear ideas like uh, the US empire is uh, getting worried because China's finally rising and uh, you know, rejuvenating the, the nation after a century of humiliation. So the US is a kind of threatened hegemon. Uh, you'll hear that uh, the US is trying to, to prevent uh, China from, from growing economically and especially trying to prevent China from reaching the, the top end of uh, technological production in areas like semiconductors, aerospace, etc. So you're more likely to hear those ideas and to accept them because they make your tribe, your team, your nation uh, sound better or they're, they're more favorable to your team, your tribe, your nation. Uh, oh, what? That book? Uh, I didn't even notice it was there. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that, that really was the question I was trying to answer was why do people believe what they believe about politics? And, uh, you know, there was a, a book uh, uh, from the 1980s by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky called Manufacturing Consent, and it proposes a uh, propaganda model of the U.S. media system. And 
even though the book itself was explicit that it wasn't proposing a conspiracy theory, that it was just proposing political economic pressures or filters that affect the way that the US media system operates, nonetheless, a lot of people who read it uh, seemed to think that it was proposing this grand conspiracy theory whereby the government and or corporate elites uh, tell you know, journalists, this is what you're going to say, don't say that. Uh, so anyway, I, I was puzzled by the reaction because you know, they explicitly said that that's not our argument. Nonetheless, a lot of critics said that is their argument. So I thought that what was really missing there was an explanation of how uh, people's psychological traits or our universal psychological biases, rather, how that might help this kind of bottom-up propaganda system or emergent propaganda system uh, come to be. Uh, how could it be that so many journalists could uh, avoid talking about topics that would uh, kind of impinge on U.S. national interest, as defined, of course, by the, by the government? Uh, and how could then they also focus very intently on the uh, perceived crimes of enemy states? So you, you, you look at official enemies and you condemn them. But if, you have the, if you're looking at the wrong victims, because they're the victims of an allied government, then they tend to ignore that. So I thought it was interesting to look at you know, how uh, psychological dynamics might allow that sort of a system to function without there needing to be any sort of top-down conspiracy. Uh, and so that's basically what the, the book looks at, uh, how political economic uh, pressures and psychological biases both combine to create a sort of uh, bottom-up propaganda system or emergent propaganda system without any sort of top-down control. Uh, there was an a, a African media scholar who put it, uh, uh, control of the means of communication, control of the media is the beginning of political wisdom. <laughs> uh, and that's uh, very, very true. If you can control the information that is available, widely available, if you can, even better than that, control the beliefs of people in a country, uh, then governing them becomes so much easier. If you just keep people ignorant, it lets you do whatever you want to do or lets your interest group do whatever it wants to do. Um, but either way, whether, it, whether you're in a system where it keeps most people ignorant or you're in a system where it keeps people within a very small ideological spectrum, uh, the, the, the wisdom is the same. It's easier to rule when you have control over beliefs. And it's, it's funny because you know, people think of, uh, of uh, China or, or uh, North Korea, perhaps, as examples of, of places where the, the government very effectively controls what people believe. But the United States isn't much different in the effect. The end result uh, is not terribly different. Uh, you don't have, a, you have no organized left in the US, like a, a real uh, left. When you look at the 20th century around the world, and what the left means. Uh, it has many varieties of Marxism, but all sorts of ideas about nationalizing industry, socializing production. There is no left in the US that is, that is arguing for these things. Uh, so uh, in the US, you don't have a, a full spectrum of ideological debate. It's a very constrained spectrum that goes from uh, basically like centrist liberalism over to uh, kind of uh, relatively far-right nativism, uh, anti-immigrant xenophobic uh, beliefs, uh, very, very conservative ideas on uh, social issues, and of course, very right-leaning ideas about foreign policy, whereby the belief is that the, uh, the United States government should dictate to the rest of the world uh, whatever it wants the rest of the world to do, uh, international law be damned, and that is a totally acceptable position. Likewise, on the center liberal side, that's basically the same belief, but it's, it's presented in a much nicer way, that the US should try to work within the guidelines of international law and should try to work on a multilateral basis uh, whenever possible. But if push comes to shove, then yeah, international law goes out the window and uh, unilateral, unilateral action is entirely acceptable. So if you want to expand your, your group to win an election, uh, then you're dealing in the realm of, of ideas. You need to persuade people that your ideas will help them, that your ideas would be better for the, 
for the national group, for the local group, et cetera. Uh, so you have to make your ideas attractive and convince people that they should expend some energy to help your group, even if it's just by voting, uh, but maybe also volunteering. So then you have to think, OK, what ideas does this target group already have? Uh, and then your pitch to them uh, is kind of like, you know, you should kind of think like a, a marketer, an advertiser. Uh, what do they believe? What do they want? What are their values? And how can I explain my beliefs and my political program in a way that connects with their values, their beliefs, uh, et cetera? Uh, so a lot of the time you have to engage in a lot of just simple education. Because for you, you it's very hard for people. It's called the, the curse of knowledge. It's very hard for people to understand the difference between what they know and what other people know. It's very hard for people to understand what other people might be ignorant of. We just tend to assume that everything we know is known by everyone else, but it's not. So when you're trying to convince other people, you need to first know not only what they know and what they believe, but what they don't know. Because a lot of things uh, that you know might be central to your political beliefs and your political program. So for instance, if you know that uh, inequality is a massive problem in your country or state or region or whatever. That piece of information, that bit of knowledge, is probably going to be central to an additional belief that the government should take measure X, Y, and Z to address inequality. So if, you, if that's part of your political program, your party's program, you need to find out first, do people in the broader population who aren't part of our party, do they know this fact? And if they don't know this fact, you need to educate them about it before you can even start to uh, uh, attract them to join your, your party and convince them that your solution is the right solution. If they don't know anything about the problem in the first place, it's going to be very hard to pitch them or, or, or convince them to adopt your solution to the problem.